Well, men, did you have a good time with the retreat this weekend? Was it edifying? Yes. Yeah? Good. I, uh, did somebody just say tater tot? <laughs> okay. That's a story for another time. Uh, but thanks again to everyone that came out and uh, participated in that, and thanks especially to those who helped uh, plan it and get that uh, going. And um, I mentioned this on Friday night, but I'm going to mention it again, not to embarrass anybody, but I'm going to have to do so anyway. Uh, but there were three people uh, specifically that weren't at the men's retreat that helped with the men's retreat, and they weren't at the men's retreat because they're women, so there you go. But um, uh, Haley Murphy did a wonderful job getting the name tags designed and the logo all set up so it looked nice, so thank you to Haley, wherever she is. And um, she's here? Yeah. And uh, next, Julie DeCryf. Um, as you guys, Julie is a, you guys know that she's amazing. I can just say, hey, um, text her, I need, I need this with the form, can we do this? And then two minutes later, it's done. I mean, that's how quick it is, she's, she's really great. So thank you to Julie very much as well, please. <laughs> and then uh, finally, uh, our wives sacrifice a lot when this stuff happens. I know that Heidi, um, didn't get to see me much, which I know you might be thinking that's probably a good thing, but as the, I assure you that she would not say that. Uh, but thank you uh, for giving up a lot of evenings and, uh, and time while I, I planned this. So, love you. All right. I know you guys are expecting a short joke. I do have the Spurgeon beard oil. For those of you who heard that story, it is, it is in this morning. But um, there comes a time when we have to do those kind of things. We have to, we have to put those childish things away. And uh, so with the short jokes, so I, I have a ton, but we're going we're gonna to take them. We're going to put them in a box. We're not going to do that this morning. And I'm going to take the box and we're going we're gonna to put it on the top shelf um, where I can't reach it. Open up your Bibles to Acts 8. Acts 8, I'm going to start in verse 26, and before we get into our text this morning, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Well, Father, we are grateful to be here this morning among brothers and sisters in Christ. We are humbled by your goodness to us and for us. But even as we talked about this weekend with the, with the men, that we are grateful in what you saved us from, but also what you have saved us for. Let that thought ring true this morning. Let us meditate on that. In times where we don't feel like we have a purpose, like we feel as an outsider. Be with every heart in here, Father. Don't let anyone walk out not knowing who you are and what our purpose is. That's my prayer this morning. Father, keep me from error this morning and we open up your word and I just pray that you would bless this body. Thank you for this body. And be with us in our time now. Send your spirit, Father, to, to blow through this, this room. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me read our text this morning. Acts 8, 26 to 39. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of, of the scripture that he was reading was this, 
Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation, for his life is taken away from the earth? And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Now, I'm not sure if you're like this. I'm willing to bet that a lot of you are, but one of the great things I find about the Bible, about the Scripture, is how it never, ever gets old. As many passages of Scripture as you memorize... And the stories that you're familiar with, even from young ages in Sunday school, the psalms that we sing, we read this book over and over again because God in his goodness keeps revealing his goodness to us in new ways. Is that true? It never gets old. And this is how that text is for me. Some time ago, I was reading through Acts, and I came across the story again, and and this time as I was reading a detail that started jumping out to me that I hadn't even thought of before, but seemed really important. Now we are just coming off the heels of the men's retreat, like I mentioned, and so I thought, what a better topic to talk about to wrap up the men's retreat than eunuchs. <laughs> and soon, I'll give you the worst men's devotional of all time, so stay tuned for that. But I want to set the context here about what's happening in this narrative. The crucifixion is past, right? We understand that. The resurrection is past. The ascension is past. So the question now is, now what? What of those who believed and followed in Jesus, what happens to those who remain in the world after Jesus turned it upside down? Do you think that they looked each other, at each other after watching Jesus ascend into heaven and then turned to each other and said, well, what are we doing tomorrow? They probably didn't understand it fully at the time, but when Jesus made this promise, it was for this time. After he was going to go out of the world, he said to them, but when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send them to you. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So we find out that indeed the Spirit is poured out at Pentecost, where in a reversal of what happened at the Tower of Babel, that's what Pentecost is, where mankind is scattered and confused, now representatives from all mankind are known, or in the known world, are gathered in one place. You see the reversal there? God scatters them and confuses them, and then he gathers them, and he pours out the Spirit so they might understand the things that the, the apostles are telling them. And so the gospel is confirmed with healings, and signs, and some of the best sermons ever recorded for mankind, all in the book of Acts. And what a gathering that must have been at Pentecost. Can you imagine that time during the church? But see, God never intended that the gospel, the good news of Christ, would remain in one place. That wasn't the purpose. So then you go further in Acts and read of Stephen in Acts 7 giving perhaps what I think is probably the greatest biblical theological sermon ever delivered as he takes this crowd through the entirety of the Old Testament, all their history, to show them specifically who Jesus is and what happened to him. And you think that would elicit great rejoicing for them, but that's not what happened. Here's how it ends. Now when they, the crowd, heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. 
But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. What a special thing. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice again, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. He died. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And so the very message that Stephen is put to death for is the one that God says has to go out into the world. And so God in his divine providence, now now hear this, this is God's providence, and we're going to see plenty of that this morning. God brings about persecution because of the message. Because we're gathered at one place, God brings persecution, and it scatters God's people. And so God, the great sower, now flings this, the good seed throughout the entire earth. So persecution hurts, but it's necessary. This then is the immediate context of the book, the gospel going out to the ends of the earth, bringing even now Gentiles into the fold. So then this is where we run into Philip, one of the chosen seven deacons, Philip the Evangelist. He goes to Samaria and he preaches Christ and there was much joy in the city. And that's where the text begins. Verse 26, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. Now, I often say, you guys have heard me say this before, and I fully believe this, that God doesn't give us useless information in his word. He gave us the specific words that we have in the text for specific reasons, and he didn't waste any of them. Even the most mundane, glossed over things that we can, we can read in scripture, we just read it and we don't even think about what's being said, they're there for a reason. So an angel speaks to Philip while he's in Samaria, and he says, go south. Go down to that road that goes down to Gaza. Oh, and by the way, it's a desert. Desert, not dessert. <laughs> desert. So the first question is, why would it be necessary to tell Philip, and even more so, have it recorded for us, that it's a desert place? I'm going to find that out in a bit. But think of it. Gaza? Gaza? No one wanted to go to Gaza, especially a Jew, that old Philistine stronghold, where basically throughout history, if you read about it, no military throughout the years could ever conquer. Now, one might be practically thinking, maybe God doesn't understand this whole revival business. (laughs) Consider what's been going on here. Philip was in Samaria proclaiming Christ, and verse 6 in in chapter 8 says this, And the crowds, crowds, with one accord, paid attention to what was being said by Philip. He was doing signs, unclean spirits were coming out of many, others were being healed. In fact, so much was going on with the Samaritans as Philip is preaching to them. So many were coming to Christ that the apostles end up sending Peter and John down to Samaria to help. Crowds were being converted. This was a spiritual awakening. Yet God tells Philip to the angel, I want you to leave, and I want you to go to the desert. Lifeless, waterless, desolate, nobody's there. No man's land. No one wants to go that way. And God says, I want you to. Now what sense would it make for Philip, who is being used by God in such a way, in the conversion of so many people, to leave towards some desolate place. That's not how this works. Crowds are coming to Christ. Why doesn't he stay and preach? And and even more people are coming to Christ. And God says, I want you to leave them, and I want you to go here. 
I want you to sink that in. He sends him into the desert for what we're going to find out is the conversion of one single Gentile eunuch. Does this not speak of God's love for his people? This is leaving the 99 to go after the one. And so Philip's response, verse 27, and he rose and went. Notice the immediate obedience. We don't read that Philip questioned the commission or complained about leaving his success. Like, what are you doing? Do you see what's happening here? He doesn't do any of that. He doesn't ask God for a project plan or a business case. No, he was being used of God, and so being used of God, he just got up and he went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. So now we're introduced to this man, and we learn several important details about him. Number one, he was an Ethiopian. Number two, he was a eunuch. And number three, he was in charge of all the money. Now, ancient Ethiopia was a kingdom that existed essentially southeast of Egypt along the Nile. So when you think of Ethiopia today, it's not quite the same place. This was a bigger kingdom, closer to Cush. In fact, they, they basically were called the same thing. So we're not thinking of modern-day Ethiopia, but a, a larger kingdom. In fact, it was ruled by a series of queen mothers. The sons thought, were thought of as being too sacred for the affairs of the world, so the queen mothers would rule in their place. And so this title, this is not a personal name. This isn't just, I am Candace. It's a title, right? It's not a, it's not a personal name. Think of like Pharaoh for the Egyptians or Caesar for the Romans. That's who Candace was. Now, as mentioned, this man is labeled as a eunuch. And a eunuch is a castrated male. The Greeks called them half-men. Now, sometimes in the Septuagint, the term eunuch can simply just mean official. And the second question I ask is, why do we care? <laughs> it seems a little TMI. Can we just leave him as an Ethiopian who was a foreigner and he had some issues? Seems that God would record the story for us and make sure that this man was understood to be a, a, as a eunuch for a very specific reason. We're going to see that. In fact, we're going to see that this term is repeated five times in these verses, which suggests that this man was a true eunuch, not just a court official. He was a eunuch eunuch. But it was common in the kingdoms of that time that court officials were often eunuchs. You think of Daniel. If you read Daniel, there's a, there's a number of eunuchs in that story that, that were in the court or the Ethiopian eunuch who delivered the prophet Jeremiah out of the muddy cistern. But where queens ruled especially, the men who served them were eunuchs. And it made sense because being a eunuch meant, and I quote another commentator here, they did not imperil the integrity of the king's harem and could be fully devoted to the crown. So let the reader understand there was no hanky-panky. So it was not at all unusual that the court officials were true eunuchs. And so we also find out that this particular eunuch essentially served as the finance minister, the treasury secretary. So the ancient Nubian kingdom of Ethiopia was extremely, extremely wealthy, okay? And so the court official, anybody that served in that kingdom, was also extremely wealthy. And we're going to find that out. He even owns his own chariot, which is not cheap, and he owns an Isaiah scroll, which is not cheap. So here's the next question. What was a Gentile from a faraway place about 11 to 1,300 miles? Think of the distance between like here and, and like Disneyland, right? What is he doing on this road? Well, the text tells us. He had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning seated in his chariot. Now think about the verse just a second. Think about that. How? Why? What was an Ethiopian eunuch doing in Jerusalem? To come and worship of all things. The Ethiopians had their own gods. 
Does this not strike you as strange? Those guys 13 mile, 1,300 miles from home to worship a God they had really no business being there? In fact, I, I asked myself, how did this eunuch even know there was a God in Jerusalem to worship in the first place? Amazingly, another remarkable act of providence, God set up this entire narrative a thousand years before we get to this story, in a story that at first glance doesn't have anything to do with this narrative in Acts 8. I'm going to read to you 1 Kings 10, and you know the story, but listen to what God says here. Now when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions, and Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing hidden from the king that he could not explain to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food at his table, the seating of his officials, and the attendance of his servants, their clothing, his cupbearers, and his burnt offerings that he offered at the house of the Lord, there was no more breath in her. And she said to the king, Happy are your men. Happy are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who has delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel. She was amazed. And there's some more exchanges. And then Solomon gives her some things and then she turns and she goes back to her own land with her servants. Well, it turns out that Sheba was smack dab in the middle of the ancient kingdom of Ethiopia. She brought back what she had seen, the knowledge of Yahweh, the God who put Solomon on the throne, and it spread. Again, I mentioned the Ethiopian eunuch in Jeremiah. This is not an unusual thing. Jeremiah 39, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the guard. Go and say to ebed melech the Ethiopian, who was a eunuch, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will fulfill my words against this city for harm and not for good, and this shall be accomplished before you on that day. But I will deliver you on that day, declares the Lord, and you shall not be given into the hand of the men of whom you are afraid. For I will surely save you, and you will not fall by the sword, but you shall have your life as a prize of war, because you have put your trust in me, declares the Lord. That's what he says to the Ethiopian eunuch in that story. And so we gather there was a pretty large Jewish influence in that kingdom for a long time. So you fast forward to the descendants of that kingdom, one who we would call a God-fearer, who traveled no short distance to get to Jerusalem to worship. But I want to picture this man and think about what it would have looked like for him. He wasn't a Jew. He was a foreigner. So when he got to Jerusalem, to the temple, he could only come so far. Okay? That was strike one. Strike two was the fact that he was a eunuch. So even if he wanted to convert to the Jewish religion, become a proselyte, he couldn't do it if he wanted to. Yes, some Gentiles did. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy 23.1. I told you we're going to look at the worst men's devotional of all time this morning. Now, there are little ears here, so I'm not going to read it, because I'm not going to get thrown out of the church. But I want you to turn to Deuteronomy 23, uh, verse 1, and, I'll, and I want you to read it, and I'll give you a few seconds. Go. And I hope to God it's the right verse. (laughs) I got it? No one who was a eunuch was allowed to even enter the temple court. So this guy has two things against him so far. He's a Gentile and he's a eunuch. Worst men's devotional of all time. So though he came to Jerusalem to worship, he was still an outsider. He could only come so far, barely even get close. The eunuch was barred from the intercourse. He was cut off. I won't tell you who gave me that joke. 
But now we find him returning home, seated in his chariot, and we also find that he was reading the prophet Isaiah. He had the Isaiah scroll with him. Now this is amazing in and of itself, and it shows how wealthy this eunuch was because those scrolls were not cheap. Then we go back to Philip, and the Spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him. He must have been fast. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, because in those days when you read, you read out loud. So Philip would have heard him. And he asked, do you understand what you're reading? Now Philip, who had been preaching to the crowds, was now told to go over and join one guy in his chariot. That ought to, that ought to make us a little bit of ashamed in ourselves, doesn't it? He chased this guy down to evangelize. He wasn't afraid to approach him. Wealthy guy in his own chariot reading Isaiah out loud and Philip chases him down. So I ask, why are we so afraid to approach strangers sometimes? In fact, Matthew Henry states this. It was a great quote. He said, we should not be so shy of all strangers as some affect to be. Of those whom we know, nothing else we know this. They have souls. So the question that Philip asks is one of the most important questions a person can answer. Do you understand what you are reading? And so the eunuch in great humility declares this. He said, how can I? Unless someone guides me. And he invited Philip to come and sit with him. At least Philip isn't running anymore. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life is taken away from the earth? This is no accident that this is what the eunuch is reading. This is the passage he's reading aloud, and Philip hears him because God told Philip in Providence, precisely when to go, when to meet up with the chariot. It was at this exact moment that this exact eunuch was on this exact road, reading this exact scripture, tell me God is not sovereign. Out in the middle of a desert, and God says, go, and Philip runs, and lo and behold, there's a chariot with an Ethiopian eunuch who's reading this passage. And God says, go talk to him. That's Providence. Now what he's reading is Isaiah 53 specifically about the suffering servant. Now we can see if you're the eunuch, you would have taken interest here. As one commentator noted this, he said, in this passage we have a figure described as God's servant who will be exalted and honored even by kings and yet is subjected to intense humiliation and suffering like a societal outcast. Sound familiar? He was treated like an outcast that would have resonated with this eunuch, perhaps in his own experience at Jerusalem. And the eunuch said to Philip, basically, who's this talking about? Does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? Which, by the way, even today, Jews... This is a highly debated question, and it has been for history. Who's Isaiah really talking about? It's not an easy thing to figure out. But then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning, beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. So it wasn't so hard for Philip. One commentator remarked this. He said, some people, when they open their mouths, shut the scriptures. It may never be so with us. But when Philip opens his mouth, he opens the scriptures up. Why? Because he talks about Jesus. The second way I stated the most important question you can answer is do you understand what you're reading? The eunuch, in trying to answer this question, asks his own Who is the prophet talking about? But Philip doesn't hesitate. He says, It's about Jesus. What is the test of a man's understanding his Bible? It's this, that Jesus Christ is everything to him. 
For Philip, who did understand it when he explained it, preached unto the eunuch Jesus and nothing else. And what's interesting is we know that Luke wrote Acts, and so you'd think there's some similarities, and Philip preaches to the eunuch the same way that Christ preached to the two on the road to Emmaus. Do you notice this? Same way. Luke 24, 27, in beginning, when Jesus meets up with these two guys, in beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all in the scriptures the things concerning himself. He's the center. He's the reason. He is the highest priority of scripture. Period. He's the key to unlocking the Bible. He is the main thing. And so that's what Philip preaches. Spurgeon recounts this, this story. He said, I would never preach a sermon, the Lord forgive me if I do, which is not full to overflowing with my master. I know one who said I was always on the same old string and he would come and hear me no more because all he talked about was one thing. He said, if I ever preached a sermon without Christ in it, then he would come. And he said, uh, he will never come while this tongue moves. A brook without water? A cloud without rain? A well which mocks the traveler? A tree twice dead? A sky without a sun? A night without a star? It's a place of mourning for angels and laughter for devils. Oh, we have to have Christ. And there couldn't have been a better passage for the eunuch to be reading aloud than Isaiah 53. But I want to park on a very subtle word here in verse 35 in Acts. It reads this, And beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. Beginning with, which means he started there. Archimenos, the time or place at which something begins. So, what Luke is telling us is he didn't just stop with Isaiah 53. He kept going. He had the Isaiah scroll. I said it was a perfect starting point in Isaiah 53. Now, we don't know if he brought it with him, this eunuch. Like he had it and then he brought it to Jerusalem. We don't know if he purchased it at Jerusalem. Now, I tend to think that he probably already owned it and brought it with him because it was the Septuagint version, okay? Which providentially, by the way, was produced in Alexandria where Greek was the common language of the region. So he probably got a hold of one of these things early on. Now, Philip started there, it's reasonable to think, and I checked this out with three different biblical theology professors to make sure I wasn't crazy. And they said, well, at least not for that. That they would have kept reading. So they would have read things like, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. They would have read about the eternal covenant of peace in chapter 54. Remember, they didn't have chapters back then. They just, they just read sections. Then going on in chapter 55, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come, buy, eat. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it will accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing which I sent it. So verse after verse, promise after promise, Philip explains to the eunuch that the suffering servant, this one treated like an outcast, is also the Lord of glory. And he tells the eunuch what Jesus has done and what he's promised. And then if you keep reading, you come to Isaiah 56. And here we find the most remarkable thing considering the context of Acts 8. As I mentioned, Luke goes through great pains to make us understand, almost imploring us not to forget that this Ethiopian was a eunuch. 
He didn't just keep calling him the Ethiopian, he keeps calling him the eunuch. Five times, the eunuch, the eunuch, the eunuch. So when you're reading, your mind would say, oh yeah, the eunuch. The eunuch who's reading about this suffering servant, and imagine this connection when they get to this in Isaiah, which I think they did. And this is why he started here. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness. For soon my salvation will come and my deliverance will be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. This one gets me, sorry. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. Isn't that amazing? I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. So even Isaiah makes the joke. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be a servant, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. And get this, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house should be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. Ah, see, now we understand why Luke made sure that we knew this guy was a eunuch. Now we understand why even more the suffering servant that this man was reading about meant so much to him. All of this we just read about in Isaiah is only made possible through Christ. This man had so many restrictions placed on him. And then to hear this, that what the Messiah had done was to include him. Can you imagine that? This individual had traveled all the way to Jerusalem to worship a God he didn't really know, arrives only to find that he's disqualified from worship, not just by one thing, but by two. Double whammy. A foreigner. And then if he wanted to proselytize, he couldn't because he was a eunuch. He was a man unfit, out of place. So I was thinking about this, and I can only ponder, and I've talked to some of you, I can only ponder how many of us have felt that way, that you are unfit for service, unfit to be a Christian, that you're not welcome. That perhaps there's some defect, some sin, some lacking quality that makes God hesitate on his goodness towards you, even his love for you. Maybe you stand or sit in the back or you look on from afar and think, what I wouldn't give to be included in the worship of God. But God would never accept me. So here he is, this Ethiopian eunuch, riding in his chariot with Philip. Philip starts in Isaiah 53. He explains all these things to him, the good news about the suffering servant who in humiliation and death opened the way. And then we read in verse 36, and as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here's some water. What prevents me from being baptized? So we assume that Philip explained baptism to him, or perhaps even saw the, the washing rituals of the priests of the temple, going, man, I wish I could. And he hears this good news, and he doesn't wait, but at the first opportunity he says, I want to be baptized. Now what providence? Remember we said this is a desert place, and God provided <laughs> enough water for a baptism at that moment? It was needed. And he said, there's some water. It's a desert. <laughs> Now, in your Bibles, you probably, if you notice, you're missing verse 37, aren't you? Or there's a note there. 
So it's not in the earliest manuscripts. But if it was there, it it says, and Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So we don't have that in the original, but no matter that, the principle is still the same. Because Philip heard enough, apparently, and didn't hesitate to baptize him. Philip was convinced that it was okay to do it, because then we read, and he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So whatever confession this eunuch made, it was good enough for Philip. So this eunuch, unfit, disqualified, is now joined to Jesus. Can you imagine the delight of this man? And we know that he was delighted because it's the greatest ending in Scripture to to any story besides the resurrection, of course. We know he was delighted because verse 39 says this, And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. Rejoicing. Through Christ, this man who was unfit had been made fit. He was an outcast, and now he was drawn in. The 99 had been left so that the Lord would pursue this one. Fulfilling what Brian read to us earlier. That's why we read that in Psalm 68. Nobles shall come from Egypt. Cush shall hasten to stretch out her hands to God. That's the kingdom that he's talking about there. And so as this Ethiopian reaches his arms out and he's baptized and he joins Christ, this psalm at least has a beginning of the fulfillment. That's the whole point of Acts, that the gospel goes out to the nations and this eunuch is proof that it's doing that very thing. The eunuch had been made whole. He who was prohibited was now permissible. And he went away rejoicing. So here's the question. Will you go away rejoicing this morning? Have you gone away rejoicing? Have you ever left a service rejoicing in who Jesus is and what he has done and what he has made us? Now, that was a theme that we talked about the men's retreat is set apart by and for a holy God, remembering that a holy God is, is, is a delight and not just delighting in what he saved us from, but what he has saved us for. This eunuch was saved, and he was made for worship. So are you. So will you go away rejoicing this morning? Do you know that the same God who had Philip leave this multitude of the Samaritans and chase down a chariot on a road to save this one Ethiopian eunuch is the same God that pursues you? He hasn't changed. Do you think that you are unloved, unfit, forbidden to come? Then rejoice in the suffering servant who has made you fit for service. Made you fit for the most holy place. Because that's where the Spirit dwells. That's where Christ is. And so it's my prayer that you go away this morning rejoicing because you've been made whole. Let's pray. Father, we stand in awe of your word and just reading the, the, the providences that you put together, knowing the end from the beginning, declaring those things, the salvation of your people, that this Queen of Sheba from a thousand years before this eunuch even existed brought this knowledge back. That you place this man on this road with the same time that he tells Philip to go and meet with him. And Father, I know that in our own lives we can look back and we can rejoice in the providence that you used to bring us to the faith. You put a certain person in front of us. You let us hear a certain message a certain event in life, trial or praise or whatever it is that you have orchestrated salvation for your people 
And that where we were unfit, as Romans tells us, we were unfit, sinful, hating you. You have now changed us. You have given us a new heart, a new covenant heart that delights to serve you. Praise your name this morning, Father. Thank you for Jesus. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.